On behalf of Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Liberty for Freedom, um, we are more than happy to welcome you to our web talk to volume number nine on the 10 most underreported humanitarian crises 2020, today dedicated to Papua New Guinea, short PNG. Um, before I have the pleasure to introduce you to our panel, uh, please let me just give you a, a bit of a back, back information on the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and CARE International, uh, who has edited this, this uh, very list we, we are talking about today. So uh, Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom is a German agent of, if you, like, if you will, organized liberalism uh, offering civic education and international dialogues are uh, active in more than 60 countries. And yeah, this is obviously a, a liberal mission Friedrich Naumann Foundation is fostering. Care International uh, is the organization that has produced the uh, list of the 10 most underreported humanitarian crises 2020. It is a global confederation of 14 members working together to fight poverty in more than 104 countries worldwide. Yeah, and uh, this is, as I said, our topic today, Papua New Guinea. Uh, why do some crises make headlines while others do not? And obviously, uh, Papua New Guinea made its entry for the first time in this list, which have been compiled by Care International since 2016. And obviously, the year 2020 have been a year like no other, uh, making, because of COVID-19, making bad situations even worse. And obviously, it is a, a challenging situation for Papua New Guinea, too. For those of you who haven't been able to travel to Papua New Guinea yet, just a short, short idea. Uh, we're talking about uh, a country of 8 million people, Southwest Pacific country, over 80% of the population living in far-flung villages without uh, access to electricity, running water or healthcare. And obviously with this comes uh, a mixture of difficult uh, situations, man-made uh, man uh, disasters and natural disasters such as floods, uh, earthquakes, cyclones, droughts, you name it, it is there. And obviously we have man-made disasters too. We're talking about uh, tribal conflicts. We're talking about internal displacements, um, poor infrastructure, poor health uh, system, um, the list goes on. So it is with a reason we are talking about a humanitarian crisis in uh, Papua New Guinea. And this is what we are going to cover today. We want, with our panel, we're going to dive in, want to analyze a little bit our uh, political situation in a you, in young democracy. Uh, Papua New Guinea became independent from Australia in 1975. And there has been a, a challenging political context as well as economic and social challenges. So with this said, um, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome our panel. Our panel currently located in Papua New Guinea and Australia, and I'm starting with Caroline Fanu. She is um, uh, um, I'm, I'm here. I'm just just here. She uh, is. Um, I'm just trying to find out my thing. So you are uh, obviously you are a filmmaker. You are a content producer. Uh, you are, as you, as you call yourself, a child of Oceania, so a very poetic way to, uh, to honour your Tongan Australian heritage. Um, you have been living in Papua New Guinea only since 2020, as, as far as I remember, as I heard. You're the founder of uh, the Pacifica Film Fest, and you have produced a, a video, a short one, which we have the pleasure to, to see uh, uh, in a very short amount of time. So first of all, uh, welcome, Carlo. Great to have you here with us. Uh, next, one very warm welcome. next one I'm going to introduce is Justine McMahon. She is uh, PNG's country director for uh, Care International, has been working in the area for more than 25 years, working as a journalist, as an editor as well, and obviously in, in contacts with humanitarian organizations. Um, you have worked for Caritas Australia and now for, for Care International since 2016. So we're very happy to have you and just touch ground and see what is the situation on the ground. Welcome to see. Thank you, Brida, and hi, everyone. 
Hello. So next one, Shane McLeod in confinement in Sydney. Um, um, <laughs> this is not your normal state. Um, no, you're uh, normally you. <laughs> You are, and I quote, a research fellow and project director for the Lowy Institute Australia Papua New Guinea Network Project. Wow, this is a title. Uh, no, but you are a true expert in everything PNG is offering. Um, but you have been working as a journalist editor too before joining uh, the Lowy Institute. So we're very happy to have you and get your insight on everything political and, and uh, challenging, uh, whatever it is. So yeah, great to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks, Bridget. Thank you. Um, our next guest is not with us, uh, we suppose because of internet connection, but anyhow, I'm going to introduce Dr. Diane Boruba, uh, agricultural scientist and political advisor, and, and actually uh, someone from uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, home province East Suffolk. So we hope he will join us and give us, uh, yeah, really an insight on what it is on the ground and working with um, yeah, conditions in the communities in Papua New Guinea. That said, uh, we are ready to rock. Uh, we only have 60 minutes. So yeah, we would like to start with Caroline's movie. Um, and we're looking forward to have your five minutes take on Papua New Guinea and you are yeah, allowing us to zoom in. So let's start the movie, please. A bit of time. Atin te te ko mamari rabit na ta atuta na te ibulue na morogo na pipi na pukai abororbanian mamari na te ranguranela e goramong. Hi everyone, my name is Kalolaine Fainu and um, I'm coming to you from Papua New Guinea. Um, I've been in Papua New Guinea since uh, early 2020. Um, previous to that I've been travelling back and forth as I have some family history here um, takes us back four generations and so I've always had a close relationship with Papua New Guinea um, but haven't actually lived here until just recently. And I really enjoyed um, getting to know this country and the people and being able to sort of connect to a place that I knew through storytelling, um, through my grandparents, aunties and uncles. Um, so I had this really close sort of affinity to um, the place but had never really experienced for myself. What's really great about you know being able to work with um, organiz organizations like CARE is it, it allows me to continue to build on that connection and especially by doing uh, the storytelling kind of work um, that I get to do. This kind of project work fits into all the things that I really love about life and, and which I, I want to pursue more of which is you know sort of you know travel and, and adventure going to rural communities um, meeting new people and, and doing storytelling and using the craft that I know, which is storytelling and, and content gathering, media making, to be able to collect and share backstories from within these you know, wonderfully um, diverse and unique places. It's one of those jobs that you have to say thank you for, for, for the opportunity because um, you know, I feel really blessed to be able to do all the things that I really love. Having lived here for a couple of years now and working in uh, the media making, content creation industry, um, it is very, very, very male dominated. If we see people, if we see other women leading the way, then we know that we can do it as well and it gives us confidence to stand in spaces that are sometimes uh, dominated by or, or, or thought of as being you know, a men's only sort of arena and um, breaking down those barriers is always a great thing to do. I think one of the really cool things that has come out of um, COVID actually 
has been that a lot of international organisations um, have not been able to send um, their own staff over to you know, places like Papua New Guinea or anywhere around the world for that matter. And so they've had to look for local content creators, um, which I think, you know, why aren't we doing that already? Um, so I'm a huge supporter of, um, you know, hiring um, local um, talent um, over, you know, importing people into a, into a country. I mean, it makes so much sense, um, you know, not, a, not only from a cost perspective, but you are supporting, you know, local talent. Um, you have got the um, advantage of local knowledge and language and the kind of access and insights that you wouldn't get from sending somebody else over. It's something that I really support. It's something that I did through my Pacifica Film Festival um, in us wanting to tell stories only made by Pacific people. So we say, you know, Pacific stories in Pacific voices. I think it's important. Um, I think that, you know, the perspective that one has from belonging to a place um, is just something that you can't get if you don't come from that place and, and um, I think it's important that also that you know it, it's um, stories are told in our voices rather than told by an outside outside voice and uh, you know there's a huge amount of value in that plus you know you must you feel great you feel great if you're supporting um, local local talent and, and contributing to improving their lives because the more work that they do and the more content and more the more experience that they can get um, to be the creators the more their voices are elevated and, and the more equal we all become Carla, thank you very much. That was that was fantastic. I mean, especially for those who have never had the privilege to travel to PND. I mean, it's a it's it's a great, fantastic way to just zoom us in, making the travel thirteen thousand kilometers from where I'm sitting to where are you, where you and Justin are right now. So fantastic. Thank thank you very much. Um, but it is with the reason that uh, that uh, Papua New Guinea entered the list of a human humanitarian crisis, right? So, uh, Justin, would you would you be so kind to just give us a, 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 an idea of what it is? Carlos's uh, picture showed a, a reality that is far away from from crisis, right? Um, could we could you name it, Justin? What what is it? What makes a humanitarian crisis in in PNG? Yeah, thanks, Britta. Um, I guess, you know, in a way, the crisis is actually a silent crisis because it's something that is almost, um, it's, it's not spoken, but it's very much present. And under those beautiful and amazing pictures that showed hospitality and family and the connectedness to land, um, there is also an issue of violence within families that for different reasons, um, too many people suffer from. And I think at the moment, that's one of our biggest issues. And I think as Carlo also touched on in that short clip, is that there is an issue still of inequality between men and women and opportunities for boys and girls. Yeah, we're we're going to to address all the all these points a little bit later, especially when we're going into what what is Care International doing? What are your lines of of work? So we're looking forward to to, to this, Justin. Shang, uh, please, you you your take on on the humanitarian crisis in PNG. Talking your your point of interest obviously is is politics. So we are talking about a country that have been in permanent political turmoil for for a long time. A young democracy. What what would you say? What what makes it so so challenging? and uh, vulnerable as a young democracy right now. It is so I'm going to turn myself on first. Um, yeah. I think one of the challenges, and I think a lot of people in Papua New Guinea are feeling this right now, is that the political system 
is struggling to reflect the aspirations of people to, to tackle many of these problems. Um, the way that PNG's democracy, and you know, it's a democracy inherited largely from Australia, from British traditions, largely that, that democracy doesn't allow responsiveness to some of these crises in the day-to-day -day of political life. Um, elections happen every five years, people are elected, um, and then there's massive turnover at each election. There's no opportunity for people to have their say in the intervening period between those elections every five years. So parliament can kind of operate as its own house, its own um, decision-making chamber without really reference to the people. And the sense I get, the sense I get from speaking to Papua New Guineans who, who share their frustrations at many of the challenges facing PNG society is that it's that political system is just not providing the responsiveness that they would expect and that they want. Mm. And that's why problems such as graft and corruption are, 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 are spreading and we're, we're going to talk about this, this, this later on. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, Kelly, as a founder of the Pacifica Film and Arts Festival, you, you had a mission statement, and I would like to quote when you said, um, uh, we are about to head out across Oceania, armed with the passion, the pride, and the pain of the Pacific. Would you say that this formula of passion, pride, and pain is, is, is visible in, in, in Papua New Guinea too, the pain especially, as Justin said, it's a hidden, it is a silent crisis. Um, I mean, I definitely feel that that, that statement um, is relative to, to living here as well. Um, and I think it, depending on, on, on where you are and who you're talking to, um, people can respond to that in a different way. I think what sometimes the pain keeps people silent, but sometimes it's also fueling people. I, what I saw with a lot of, or what, you know, what I've noticed in, in my short time here, especially um, last year when there was a whole string of stories that related to um, gender-based violence, um, what I saw was a real uprising of voices in the younger generation, um, you know, uh, sort of university aged people and people who've had um, access to internet now that that, you know, they have that access here now, or maybe have had experiences with the outside world. And, and uh, uh, what I saw was a beautiful swell of young people being, uh, having their voices being lifted up through, you know, rejecting that this, this violence that's, that's happening in their communities, that's happened to their aunties and to their mums and to their sisters. Um, so, you know, I think in, in that respect that, you know, the pain is, is sort of almost getting enough and, and, and some, there is a generation of people, there are groups of people who are using that to, to lift up their voices and concerns and, and take their, their messages to parliament, which is what they did and, um, you know, create campaigns and more awareness. And for me, that was a, it was a positive thing to see those sort of, um, you know, youth led movements happening here in PNG. Mm, yeah, thank you, Keller. Um, just before continuing uh, to our audience, uh, as, as you can see, you have your, your uh, uh, FNA uh, uh, function there installed. So uh, whatever question, comments, we, we are happy to bounce them to our experts here. And please don't, don't hesitate to give them. We still have time until 12 o'clock uh, our time. Um, Justin, would you, would you be so kind to just give us an idea of the line of work K International is doing? Um, you have been with K International since two, uh, 2016 and have been able to expand the, 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 yeah, the scope, the scale of operations. What are you focusing on mostly? Everything that we do has women and girls at the centre center of our work. Um, so what that really means is that we don't, of course, exclude men and boys, but that we make a conscious effort to create space for women and girls to meaningfully participate in every activity that we have. Um, so we work in the coffee and cocoa sector with the with the farming families we have work in the education and health sectors we work also in the uh, disaster response including now uh, the COVID response and preparedness um, and we also have recently started in peace building and conflict resolution hmm. yeah 
Yeah. Okay. And you you are located. You you are working in Garaka, right? You are in the in the Highlands, right? This is where where the office is. And... Yeah. So I'm based in the Highlands of Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And care works across the Highlands, where the biggest concentration of people are. Um, but we also work in the autonomous region of Bougainville and in some of the, the coastal provinces as well. Yeah, okay, thank you. Shane, in, in your articles, um, you are referring to a, uh, um, yeah, a world which is divided into those in power, those the elites and those who are yeah, living uh, uh, far away from education, health and everything. So what, what does it mean on, on, on the basis? I mean, we have been talking about corruption and graft um, I have a statement of a commissioner of police, uh, David Manning, who says my force includes criminals in uniforms. I mean, is, 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 this, is this real? Is this a, a real threatening to young threat to a young democracy? Um, there are massive government challenges to PNG. And I think, you know, you see the results of that day to day and people who um, Justin and Carlo would be dealing with and working with, would be dealing with the consequences of this every day. PNG has a very, I guess you'd say, cumbersome system of government that puts responsibility on different levels of government, but often the funding just isn't there to support the services that people are led to expect um, and, and they're just not receiving. So that's a, a source of massive frustration. Um, it's interesting, I think, for us to be talking about this from Australia and talking about the sort of the the invisibility of Papua New Guinea in, in countries like Germany and throughout much of Europe. Yeah. Um, the, we sort of have the converse challenge here in Australia. The project I work on um, is really about trying to build relationships between Australians and Papua New Guineans. And here in Australia with the colonial legacy, unfortunately, a lot of the perceptions and the reporting that happens about Papua New Guinea focuses very much on those negatives. Yeah. Um, so the picture that we see painted here does tend to focus on those negative aspects, whereas there are so many positives about community that are happening every day that we don't hear about. And if I contrast that with your experience from the other side of, of the planet is you just don't hear about Papua New Guinea at all. Um, so I think the, the really the positive thing that comes out of a conversation like today is that people who are watching, people who are part of this conversation today can start to find out more about PNG. And, and I guess I would say, you know, as you start to think about Papua New Guinea and look at um, a really fascinating part of the world on the other side of the planet, look for those examples, look for those situations where people are doing amazing things. Um, don't always look for the negatives. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I think it's very much in line of, of the message, uh, you, Justine and Carlo, you would like to bring to the world too, right? There is obviously there's, a, there's there are challenges and problems, but there are so many positive and encouraging uh, movements and aspects of daily life too, isn't it? Carlo? Yes, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's part of my own... Um, aim with the, the kind of storytelling that I do. I like to focus on um, stories, positive stories, stories, you know, uh, you know, we all understand that th those hardships um, exist um, and it's not to be ignored. But I think, you know, as Shane pointed out that unfortunately in some areas and PNG is one of those places that you just, you hear a lot of, you get a lot of the negative stuff, especially any, any stuff that sort of hits sort of um, international headlines. And um, to balance that out, I feel like it's my mission to, to focus more on the good stories and share that because it's, you know, I think um, I have an, a personal example where I wrote a story for The Guardian and it was about, you know, uh, it was a story about the nurses in Papua New Guinea um, and how, as frontline workers, um, th their experience, right, and during COVID, um, you know, when there's already a really fractured health system here and that, you know, they have, you know, hardly anything and don't have clean instruments and don't have support, all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, the story wasn't really about that. It was more a personal story from them just saying, you know, now we're really scared because we don't understand COVID. We don't have the training. We are already uh, under-resourced. Um, and, you know, this is our story and these are our fears. Um, but that story um, was by some people um, taken really um, in the wrong sense that they were, Papua New Guineans were offended by it um, because 
I, you know, I, I put in examples in which were literally from the words of the nurses saying, you know, of what it was like to be a patient or to be a nurse, um, you know, and, and how little they had. And I think what I learned from that experience was that, you know, they get tired of seeing themselves in, in, in that kind of light. They get tired of people always saying that, you know, you, you um, you know, it's kind of belittling in a way to always be, to see the big news saying, you know, you're, you're a violent country, you're politically corrupt, you're, you're, you're this, you're that, you know. So I think, you know, they need to also see stories about themselves that show the other side, which is, is you know, beautiful and warm and welcoming and, and you know, all the other stuff. So I think um, that was an experience that I can share about understanding what it's also like to only be seen in that light by the outside world. Yeah, thank you, Carla. Justin, uh, talking about good stories, uh, yeah, I've been working in, in PD for the last five years. Uh, uh, a story of success, a story of, uh, that touched you. Anything you would like to share? Anything you would like us to, to keep in mind when it comes to PNG? Oh, look, there are many, Britta, and I think as Shane and Carla both said, um, these are the stories that often are forgotten because, you know, it, the big headline stories are those that are more challenging and more negative. But in my own organisation, the vast majority of our managers and our senior managers are strong and skillful and outspoken women. And they, they're younger women. They've got to that point because they're educated and they have a voice and they're also now encouraging and enabling not only their younger colleagues in the organisation but also those in communities. And so for me, I think that is a real success story and that actually is the future of PNG. Yeah, 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 exciting. Shane, uh, in, in your work as a researcher, I mean, uh, and your background as a journalist, I, I, how is it possible to change the narrative to just allow PNG to just, uh, yeah, the self-confidence of PNG boosting with, with lots of, of great, great stuff, wonderful, inspiring stories, rather than giving uh, the negative uh, and, and scolding uh, element to it. How, how, can, how can media change the narrative? Yeah, I think one of them, and you know, it's a shame, unfortunately, Dean hasn't been able to join us today, but um, Dean is one of those people who can tell you that the story of modern PNG and the reality for people um, in his work, he's done a lot of work in agricultural development in East Sepik, um, which is up on the north coast of PNG, and the work that's going on just to empower people, to give them the, the tools and the, the agricultural development they need. To, to empower their own lives. I think the other thing that, um, and we sort of touched on this, but um, one of the big gaps in PNG's political system is in a parliament of 111 MPs, there's not a single woman. And that's, that's a huge problem, I think, in modern PNG, that 50% of the population is not represented in the chamber. And, you know, there's a number of male politicians who recognise this gap, um, who are working to do something about it. Um, but that, that seems to be an area where so many people would like to see change. Now, how, how that happens and what the system evolves to to make sure that the voices of women are represented in parliament, I think can make a massive change, both in domestic politics in PNG, but also how PNG speaks on the international stage. And perhaps um, to my other panelists, I'd be really interested to hear from them, um, you know, what they're hearing in the local communities about um, women planning to stand for the elections next year, so about this time next year. Mm. And, and what are the prospects, you know, that women can actually break through some of the impediments um, to, to be represented in the chamber and represent the people of PNG? Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, in a country that is ranked as one of the worst places in the world of violence against women, obviously repression and, and uh, making sure that women are, are, are locked away so they can't participate and... and uh, create a, a world of opportunities for their own, for themselves and their children. I mean, Kelly, how, how, how did, can it change? Do you know of women who are ready to step up uh, the gang and just, just entering the parliament to just say no and, and, uh, and do what they feel is best for their communities, their families from a female perspective? Yeah, um, I, 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 I have had this conversation with, you know, just um, my, my friends and, um, 
I don't know what the answer is, and I don't see a, a, um, I don't know personally of a, of, a, of a, um, many women stepping up into that space um, in terms of the upcoming election next year. Um, I've heard of I've been of a handful at um, sort of different, uh, not the top end of government, but in local level government areas. And if you hear a story, you think, oh, God, that's great. There's some, but it's very few and far between. I think, um, you know, what at my group of friends and I were discussing was that, you know, we need, it would be really great if there was, like in, you know, say, for example, in Australia, you have some, you know, youth led parties to be able to really introduce young people, young women into that space um, from an early age, but there are so many challenges. Um, it's, there are so many barriers. It's really, I mean, I, I would, I think it's, um, an intimidating, intimidating space to step into as a woman. Um, and if there's no real support, especially from the existing members, um, then, you know, how do you, how do you get into that? Um, I, it's really, it's kind of one of the interesting contrasts about Papua New Guinea as well, because there are a lot especially in the islands region, a lot of metro women, uh, metrilineal societies here. We have really strong women leaders. And so there's, it, it's, it's interesting that, that we're not seeing more women in certain areas, especially from those societies stepping to those spaces. But I think it's, um, yeah, I don't know. There, there's no easy answer for that one from me um, right now. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, obviously you need role models, female role models for, for children to grow up and know, yeah, women can 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 create politics, can can create challenges. And if there is a lack of it, although you say um, uh, can, um, uh, structures where matrimony is um, um, matriarchy is matriarchy is is imminent, although there should be. So it's it's, it's really there. There's an official gap in it. But I think it's education too, civic education. I, I mean, I, I've grown in a country where political education is 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 done. For example, by Philip Naumann Foundation. As an early age, as as young as 13, 14, you can enroll in courses and can can become a civic a civic education, political education. And if there's a lack, obviously there, uh, it's it's hard to fill. Justine, for, for your your experience from women willing to make a difference, uh, how is it? You're you're working very much on on, on giving women uh, a bigger voice in the community. Yes, we are, and you know, I think as Carol and also Shane said, it is incredibly challenging. I live in one of those provinces where, in the last parliament there was a woman representative. And my observation of how she was judged is that she was, she was judged at a much higher mark than many of her male counterparts around the country. Mm. So when she didn't keep a promise, when um, something went wrong, people were incredibly critical and yeah. put it down to her of being a woman, whereas her male counterparts were also doing the same thing. But it was almost like, oh, well, you know, there was an ambivalence. Yeah. So there, there is so much money involved in elections that the stakes are really high and they've already started campaigning for next year's elections. So to even get to the point where you put your hand up and nominate, you have to have huge amounts of money and many women don't actually have access to those resources. Yeah, yeah, it's tragic. Um, Shane, talking about uh, the election next year, what is your, your prediction? Of what, what, is there any, uh, is there a positive change coming? Or I heard that the Parliament is adjourned until, until August right now. So uh, to, there's, uh, so to uh, cement the status po political, uh, political status quo right now, what, what does it mean for, for a country like PNG that the parliament is adjourned and election is, is next year? Yeah, under PNG's political system, we have a, a year now essentially of stability before the election. So um, essentially for the prime minister, James Marape, it's a chance to try to, I guess, get things done without facing the threat of being overthrown on the floor of parliament, which has always been one of the destabilising factors in PNG's politics. Heading towards the election, the signs are that it's going to be pretty closely contested in, in, in terms of a fairly tough campaign. Um, the last elections in 2017 were 
pretty widely judged as some of the worst in PNG's history, very disorganised, some of the administration that's needed. I mean, just the, the logistics required to run an election um, across the country are just massive. It is a huge impost on public resources, but it's such an important event in, in political life. So, you know, COVID has been a, a factor that's probably made that organisation um, even more restricted than usual. There's going to need to be a huge effort to get things like electoral rolls updated and ready for next year. And then in the midst of all that, you've got the political contest going on. And essentially, at the moment, that seems to be between the incumbent Prime Minister, James Marape, and the man he ousted back in 2019, Peter O'Neill. Um, neither of them is really willing to give any concession to the other. It does look like they're going to be the two leading candidates to form government after the election. Yeah. But PNG politics can be very volatile. It can be very quick to change. So um, it, it doesn't follow a party political system. It's not as if there's a, a strong defining ideology that will sort of unify candidates and parliamentarians around one person. It can be very much about what um, my, my colleagues have referred to about the, the, the community support it goes behind certain candidates. A lot of money is in play. A lot of campaigning is happening right now. Um, it'll be a very volatile period, both leading up to the election and in the aftermath. Mm. And as I mentioned at the start, whoever wins, you know, if, whoever gets into parliament, they're there for five years. Um, and while they don't have to listen to what the community wants after that point, they do owe a lot to the people who got them there. So. Um, politicians are sort of caught. They're caught between the people who they had to call on to get elected, trying to honour their commitments to them, but at the same time, they get a lot of demands put on them by their constituents to deliver things for them. Mm -hmm. So I think they are also pulled in many directions. Unfortunately, the consequence is that the governance that should, I guess, support services and, and things for the people often gets left behind in, in dealing with some of that. Yeah, so you would assume whoever the winner will be in next year's election, there will not be a considerable amount of, of change in, in terms of quality and participation, civic civic education and uh, quality of life, health system, infrastructure, whatever. You wouldn't you wouldn't expect any any significant improvement uh, in the near future. I wouldn't expect there to be, uh, you know, the, the campaign itself will have some policy elements, but the capacity for the government to change, uh, to implement substantial change in policy is quite limited. So I think it will be more around personalities and individual choices, you know, choices for candidates in particular electorates. Um, something that, you know, could happen in the next 12 months. One, one of the things I think um, the Prime Minister has said he might be prepared to do would be perhaps special measures, um, special electorates for women to contest, which may mean there would be a, an expectation, a requirement that there would be, there would be women members on the, next, um, on the floor of the next parliament. Yeah. It, it's getting close to the elections. It seems unlikely that anything substantial could happen on that front. But if that was to happen, I think that would be a really positive factor leading into those elections. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Justin, talking about women, equality and participation, I mean, uh, the fact that COVID-19 uh, rippled uh, Papua New Guinea, um, many of the health-related uh, services have had to be shut down, right? And left many, especially vulnerable women, uh, even more vulnerable, right? Yes, that's correct, Rida. And one of, the, one of the real dangers of this time, and you know, I have to say that COVID, COVID has largely dropped off the public consciousness. So to go into the towns to look at people, you would think that there was no such thing as COVID. No one is, well, hardly anyone now is following any of the, um, you know, any of the precautions that we know that should be followed. But what we do know is that a number of the services not related to COVID, such as maternal and child health, um, routine childhood vaccinations, have been significantly disrupted because either money has been diverted into a COVID response or 
there's been reduced capacity at the health facility level. And that in many ways is a huge danger for the future because we're seeing now that mothers are hesitant to take their children in um, to be vaccinated. We're seeing that even a number of health workers are hesitant to give vaccinations unrelated to COVID, but it's all grown up out of this COVID environment. So there's significant dangers for the future. Mm. We, have, we have been talking about sorcery to Zanguma in the, in the uh, dialect of the region. So uh, a sort of, uh, yeah, um, um, that women are suspected of participating in witchcraft. Uh, mostly women are being attacked of, of saying, uh, you, you are bringing illness, you are bringing bad stuff to our communities. And I, I read that about 50,000, especially women, particularly women, had to flee their communities because they, they were, uh, there was, were mobs uh, threatening them to lynch them. I mean, is, is this a reality you see, Justin, in your work? Is, is sorcery uh, an element uh, uh, important to consider? Yeah, I mean, I think from what I understand and talking to people from you know, a really broad spectrum of the society mm. is that there is widespread belief in sorcery. Um, but obviously that horrible violence that we've seen most is limited to a tiny minority, but the belief in sorcery seems to be quite widespread. Um, and very often it's those who are most vulnerable in the community who are targeted for different reasons. So um, women, those people who are living with a disability, older people, and they're very often the targets of this sorcery-related violence. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got this. Kelly, in your experience living, having lived in PNG since 2020, I mean, um, what is your hope for the future? Um, as well as in your profession as a storyteller, what, what are your, your next projects uh, when it comes to PNG? Is there anything in, I, knowing you a little bit, I, I bet, I bet there's something in the pipeline when it comes to PNG and stories about the Pacific. Color your yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. No, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you, Britta. Um. Yeah. Look, there's 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 plenty in the pipeline. Um. There's there's a lot of different projects that um I'm currently involved in. Um. I think. Uh. I mean, I would. What can I say? I. You know what I really like to do. I talk to a sort of you know um people that work in in the same field as I do it'd be really great to be able to establish some you know png based um uh, you know like production companies and um platforms like people are using the the facebook and the social media a lot but i think some really well organized um platforms that that allow people to share you know good content or broad a much broader range of content made um you know like i say made in their made in their own voices or things that reflect you know their their communities and their cultures and you know the cultures here are so diverse there's so many different things to be represented by lots of different people and i think when you see yourself represented in those ways in stories that you can identify with um you know i see through my experience with the pacific film fest that you know especially people um who've never had the opportunity to see themselves represented on you know a mainstream television or in a cinema or something like that the response to the and the emotional response is quite um, impactful. You know, they um, they really there's a there's a deep sense of appreciation of one just to being able to see yourself represented, um, but also what you can do with the storytelling. You know, there's so many so much education that can be done in a different way that is um, reaches people in a, in a in a more emotional way or just a more fun way or or whatever it is, there's so many different ways that a, that a film or story or uh, it can, can reach you. So, you know, I think utilising or dreaming on the sort of background and experience I have in working with Pacifica storytelling, I'd like to maybe see that kind of space grow here um, because I think there is so much that, you, that can be done with that as a tool to, um, you know, provide um, 
inspiration, motivation, education, all, all the good things. And, and for me, um, yeah, so that's if you're asking about something that I'd, I'd be dreaming of to see happen and have a really positive impact on the country in an area that I understand, that's, that's certainly um, one thing that I could talk about. Yeah, great. Um, Shane, um, we got a question from the audience asking uh, regarding volatility in politics. And obviously, there, there is a logic uh, further question, coming question. Uh, how do you think can politics be stabilized in a country that volatile? I mean, it's, it's, it's a difficult question, isn't it? Uh, I mean, you have been uh, researching and, and asking yourself this question for at least the last 20 years. So, I mean, what can be done to, to bring stability to, to a region in turmoil? It's funny, I think for a long time, Australia used to think that Papua New Guinea was very volatile in its politics and Australians would sort of go, oh, well, you know, it's a young democracy, it's learning. And then we've actually in Australia just been through a period in the last 15 years of a lot of volatility in Australian politics. Um, so as an Australian researcher, I don't feel like I can really point the finger. Um, I, I do think um, things are like trying to come up with a fix every time there's a problem isn't going to be the fix. Um, I think one of the challenges has been because PNG is a young democracy and things haven't always gone perfectly, um, people have tried to come up with the solution. So, for example, PNG had a first-past-the-post voting system until 2002, um, which delivered results of a lot of volatility, a lot of turnover of MPs, a lot of um, large fields of candidates and, and one candidate getting elected with a tiny proportion of the vote. So a proportional um, preferential voting system was brought in from 2007. It hasn't solved these problems. It's actually just extended the fields of candidates. So what, what I think needs to happen is perhaps Papua New Guinea needs to evolve the systems for itself and, and not be, um, I guess, told by outsiders how to fix how to fix things every time. I think um, PNG has traditions of consensus building, of problem solving, of leadership within its traditional cultures that perhaps can be drawn upon more to actually solve some of these challenges. Um, I think one of the issues is um, essentially the system that has been um, put in place from independence in Papua New Guinea is an external system. And while that has some attractions, it's been a successful system that's been exported to democracies around the world, there are aspects of it that perhaps jar with PNG's system. So mm -hmm. I think really the solutions are, are going to be found by turning to Papua New Guineans, um, letting the systems evolve to solve the problems. You know, I think one of the, one of the real marks of a democracy that's functioning is that it sustains and Papua New Guinea, you know, it, it has its volatility, it has its challenges, but the political system has been through some wrenching challenges, but has sustained. And I think, you know, that to me is the real measure that it may not always be perfect, but the system is still in place. It needs to flex, it needs to evolve yeah. um, rather than wholesale change. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so parachuting external experts and then helping to fix is not is not the answer, but but yeah, allow the communities to, to come up with solutions themselves. You have a trust in that, that, that Papua New Guinea is, is able to do that, right? Hmm. Well, I think it touches on what Ella was saying at the start, you know, that um, one of the, you know, benefits of the pandemic may be that Papua New Guinea has been able to turn to its own expertise. Um, whether it's through in, in sectors like development, whether it's through politics or business, you know, that um, we, don't, we haven't seen all of those benefits flow through yet. But I think, you know, there are so many emerging and talented leaders in Papua New Guinea who are searching for these solutions. Um, I think it's our role for those of us outside Papua New Guinea is to provide the support, um, but not, not to sort of always come in with the with the solutions. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Shane. Justine, I guess you are, you are in line with what Sean, Shane said, that, that it's, it's, it's the communities themselves in Papua New Guinea who have to come up with solutions and, and um, support them in this process of self-help, self isn't it? Yeah, that's correct, Britta. And, you know, I think there are a large number of highly skilled and experienced Papua New Guineans who are actually well placed to lead this change. And where I am, the Institute of Medical Research it has its headquarters. And out of the pandemic, you know, that they've really almost come out of the shadows because 
he, a lot of Papua New Guineans now realise mm-hmm. that, gee, we have this an amazing world-class medical research institute in our country that's largely staffed by Papua New Guineans who do research on all types of things, including COVID. So, um, yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think that this has to be led predominantly by Papua New Guineans. Yeah. Uh, in, in, for your work, Lining Care International, what does it mean? What, what, is the, what are projects you, you, you're, you are going to, to implement in, in the next, in the short, short and midterm? What, what is in your work of line? Line of work. Yep, sure. So a lot of our work, you know, obviously is in communities, but especially working in families. So it's to bring the family unit together and help them to actually understand the roles and the benefits of a more equal uh, decision making, of shared workload, of almost changing some of the the status quo in um, how things are done. So, for example, even simple things like taking children to a clinic or preparing the food, doing the washing. We have a a package of, um, of, of training and ways of working with families to try and affect and create longer term change within the families. And from that, we would see that that's actually the way to have a longer and more appropriate way of, of affecting change. Mm. Thank you, Justine. We got uh, a question from the audience. Obviously, there have been one who have been able to uh, evaluate CARES uh, humanitarian work on the ground. And uh, uh, the person said, I was impressed with the traditional concepts of participation, inclusion, and transparency. And now a question to the panel, how would the panel see how those can be preserved, supported and strengthened so that especially women and youth get a greater voice in change of politics, but also in the work of NGOs? Um, who's, who's ready to pick that up, please? Inclusion, participation, transparency. Yeah. Um, I can jump in and just yeah, um, talk yeah. about, it. I think some of the, some of the um, the real strength, and my fellow panelists have referred to this, but there are there are young leaders uh, coming up through Papua New Guinea who are forming organisations, who are forming, um, I guess, groups to try to influence um, processes, whether it's down at their local government level, at the local town or, or, or city authority level, um, right up to participation in, in business and community organisations. People want to make a difference. And I think people are doing that. Um, the, the, the hurdle to make it into parliament is so high that I think perhaps people are focusing their efforts on areas where they can um, directly do things. Um, there are young professionals organisations. There, are, I mean, I, I know of, um, of one person who's just essentially started a, a kind of an anti-violence group um, with bicycles. So they get together and they, just, yeah. they ride their bikes through, through town. Um, yeah. Just to draw attention to it, to get people thinking about it, get people talking about it. So I think, you know, when you see that kind of hands-on um, efforts by people, the, the people are going to gravitate to that and they're going to be the organisations, the groups that will sort of start to participate and, and, and try to influence things. I do think the, the parliamentary participation is still going to be a big hurdle for people to get over, but those community organisations can be really influential. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Shane. Another question, when it comes to supporting PNG and the young leaders in the country, how can we support them, i.g. from Europe or Australia? Do we support NGOs or grassroots? Kelly, is there there something you could could answer? A support from Europe or Australia to make PNG people stronger? Oh, no, need to, um, no need to. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe Justine would be a little bit better place to understand how maybe outside support could be, um, you know, uh, better given to to NGOs and stuff. Um, I'm a little bit stumped on 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 an answer for that one actually. Okay. 
Okay, okay. We, we could just leave it if, if anyone, perhaps, Justine, you might you might answer. Oh, J Shane, yeah, Shane, if you like. I'll jump in with one in that I'm yeah. aware of an organisation. Um, the, the efforts are underway, I think, yeah. um, to do exactly that, um, to find ways to support and channel support from outside the PNG for organisations trying to make a difference. Um, so I'd say watch this space. You know, if you're interested in knowing more about PNG, look for groups on Facebook, look for pages for organisations doing things. Um, there are some efforts underway right now that they're not necessarily out in public yet, but there are some efforts underway to, to provide a way for those of us outside PNG to support, um, whether it's political candidates or um, organisations trying to make a difference. Mm. Um, there's, Facebook is very popular in PNG and, and you can... Jump online. If you search around on Facebook for groups and pages about Papua New Guinea, you can very quickly find useful connections such as, I'm thinking off the top of my head, Transparency International, for example, does a lot of work in PNG to promote good governance and to fight corruption. Yeah. Um, there are uh, groups, uh, foundations um, and groups that you'll find and they're doing amazing community work. And so if you're looking for ways to support people in PNG, those, those direct hands-on hands grassroots organisations can be really effective ways. Hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Justin, we've got a question for you. Um, when you said that COVID disrupted uh, health services, um, there is a question, have you been able to track any increases in birth rates or child mortality? Do you think this will affect the country in the long term? So effects of COVID, what would you say? Hmm. Um, the quick answer is no, we haven't been able to track, but anecdotally we know there have been really significant disruptions. And in one province I, I was in last week in the Upper Highlands, they said there's a 66% decline in childhood vaccinations from before the pandemic. So I think if that continues, we can assume there's going to be significant long-term um, health impacts for the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. As we are already approaching our 12 o'clock mark or, or eight o'clock in your your time, I would like to, to do the circle and the finishing of wrapping up. Unfortunately, time has been flying. Uh, Carol, your, your thoughts on the future of PNG, your hopes, what, what has to be done? What, what, what are your hopes for, for your new place where you're living? What, 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 what should, should be coming to make you happy and the people happy? Um, well, we've touched on a lot of things tonight, um, you know, but obviously I think, you know, uh, oh, look, there's a, there's a long list, to be honest. I mean, you know, good, good roads, good education and a good health system is a great place to start, um, yeah. you know, and um, definitely more women in, in leadership roles and, and, and representation um, in, in, in governance across the country. I think that's something that's def desperately needed and, you um, yeah, those that's that's where I'd start. <laughs> but you know, I think I have I have a I have a I have a good feeling, and like I, I think um, uh, sometimes people always talk about you know the time before independence being being really good, and PNG has just gone downhill, and you know sometimes it, it the talk does get a little bit negative, but you know I I think there's lots of glimmers of hope out there. I actually see it. I see I see you know like these grassroots organisations. I see young people having more of a voice, and I feel that that the tide will turn. And I think that we can be really hopeful in this country for some change. Um, it won't happen overnight, um, but I do believe in its future. Great, Justin, your 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 wrapping up comments and hopes for PNG, please. I think Carlo actually. Uh, expressed it really well. So everything that Carlo said, I would agree with. But yeah. also, PNG has really strong laws. Uh, you know, it's violence, the environment, all sorts of areas. They just need to be enforced. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Shane. Your your comments, please. Hope for um, PNG. Yeah, I think you can tell uh, where things are going by looking at the emerging generation. And there are so many talented, mm. amazing, entrepreneurial, skilled, um, young Papua New Guineans who are determined to make a difference for their country. And I just think that if they're empowered, if they're able to do what they're setting out to do, the future is very bright for PNG. Thank you. Yeah, talking about a positive narrative, uh, we are concluding our web talk uh, tonight. 
uh, with with these uh, these ideas. So thank you very much uh, to Carlo, to Shane, to Justine. Unfortunately, Diane wasn't with us, but in spirit, he was with us. So thank you very much for for being with us that that late. Now it's barbecue time and confinement. Is coming. I'm not sure if you can do that, but anyhow, thank you very much for for our panel. Thank you very much for uh, audience questions and your patience. This talk has been archived, so you can always access it if you wish in the future. And with this said, uh, please allow me two uh, remarks on behalf of Friedrich Naumann Foundation. First of all, if you would like to uh, to have more insights on the 10 most underrepresented crises 2020, next Monday would be your next take on it, the last one, volume 10, covering Zambia. So uh, this plays again on Monday, but I think a later time frame. And now uh, a last a last remark on Germany. As you know, uh, crises are worldwide and global. We have been flooded uh, lately, so people are suffering here too. So uh, on behalf of Friedrich Naumann Foundation and Care International, who is involved in Aktion Deutschland Hilf, please, if you would like to donate money to those suffering here too, uh, you, you, you are well welcome. Um, you will find our links uh, will we'll give you a, a bank account and whatever you need if you want to donate to uh, German people affected by floods too. So this was my last uh, take on this. Once again uh, to uh, Sydney, to Papua New Guinea, thank you very much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Please stay healthy and, and yeah, we, we, we hope for PNG's future and hopefully we can, we can talk again uh, under even better conditions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to